Hello, everyone, and welcome into episode three of Constellation Crew for the 2022 spring semester. My name is Greg Gallagher, and as always, we're coming to you live from the Brown Planetarium here on the wonderfully cold and wet campus of uh, Ball State University here in Muncie, Indiana. I am joined tonight by Nicolette and Madeline. Caleb's going to be helping us out in the chat tonight, so if you have any questions, um, want to make any comments or anything like that, please feel free to type them into the chat, um, and Caleb can can uh, help us out there. We've got a great program tonight. We've got a couple things different planned. We've got a little today in astronomy action planned, and then um, we're going to explore a few constellations that we're going to find in our sky. So Nicolette and Madeline, how are we doing tonight, guys? You guys doing okay? Pretty good. Trying to keep warm. Yeah. Yes. Happy it's Friday. <laughs> Happy it's the weekend. Very much. I know. Hey, two weeks left until spring break, guys. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. That's that's what I'm 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 just checking off days until until it happens, right? Exactly. Yeah. All right, guys. So like I said, we got a little today in astronomy stuff. Um, it's kind of exciting because you know we had this idea to. Um, you know, do a today in astronomy if it was close to the day, right? So it was going to be like this week in astronomy. But today we've got something that happened, you know, just uh, just a few years ago, right? Just um, a few. Just a few. Yeah, just a, it's it's relative, right? That's not the number that I have written down. Right? Okay, Madeline. So what are we talking about? What what happened today more than a few years ago? So 92 years ago to this day, Pluto was actually discovered by Clyde Tomba. Pluto? No way. Yeah. I don't believe you. And that oh, name, what weird. was that name? <laughs> by Clyde. What was what? Just, just yeah. <laughs> Clyde's fine. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, ju we'll pretend we're on a first name basis with Clyde. Cool. Even though he passed away years ago, like before I was born, so. <laughs> Fair enough. But in any case, do you guys know like the history of Pluto and the whole like ninth planet thing? Actually, no. Not really. Yeah. So basically how the kind of groundwork for Pluto getting discovered was in the mid 1800s, it was theorized that there was a ninth planet beyond Neptune mm -hmm. because uh, there was something like funky going on with Uranus's orbit that couldn't be explained by the fact that were you trying to search for uh, I was trying to search Pluto yeah but it's in the <laughs> ground and I'm not gonna bother I was gonna try to pull up Pluto Pluto just doesn't want to cooperate with us today I know it's okay I mean I could go through the ground but that just takes too much effort right now yeah Pluto Pluto is being antisocial. that's fair but in any case I'll at least turn off the atmosphere so we can look at some stars um, yeah, that works. In any case, uh, Neptune alone couldn't explain the irregularities in Uranus's orbit. So this sent off a bunch of astronomers mm -hmm. searching for this so-called ninth planet, one of which was Percival Lowell. He was kind of obsessed with the idea, and he made it like his mission to try and find Pluto even made calculations, mm -hmm. and he um, he kind of have a rivalry with this one other scientist, <laughs> and they were like trying to see who could find Pluto first. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately for uh, Percival Lowell, he died before he could find Pluto. That sucks. So that sucks for him, but. <laughs> He did end up getting the last laugh in a sense because oh, yeah? it was his observatory that actually found Pluto anyway. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I love that. So, yeah. So how this goes down is uh, Percival Lowell's nephew, he wanted to continue his uncle's memory and mm -hmm. find Pluto in his honor. So he um, hires Clyde Tomba in... I think it was 1929 mm -hmm. and uh you know he was like Clyde's the man for the job and so Clyde Tomba he had to um search through photographic plates which is 
For those of you who don't know, it's very ancient astronomical technology. Such a tedious process, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he would compare plates that were taken mm -hmm. a couple of days apart to see if there are any like noticeable differences in the sky. And so, um, ironically enough, and this will allude to later in the episode, it was in the Gemini sky that he found this little flickering image. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hold up, is that Pluto? He did the calculations <laughs> and he excitedly um, told, you know, his boss and all that mm -hmm. jazz. And fun fact, Clyde was 24 years old when he discovered Pluto. So like, can you to imagine? put that in a perspective? Yeah, like, I just couldn't imagine having my entire life's work, like the most important thing I did, just, you know, being done when I was 24 years old. Like, I couldn't oh, yeah. imagine like, that. That'd be so insane. So what you're saying, oh, my... Madeline, is that I could discover Pluto any day now. Yeah. If I, I wanted to. Something. I mean, yeah. I don't know that anybody would publish you if you were like, hey, I found Pluto, guys. <laughs> well, but, even not Pluto, but you know. yeah. something like that. But it's just mind-boggling because, like, I recently turned 24, and yet Clyde was doing these sorts of things when he was my age. I'm like, yeah, I'm like just off my fair. game. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> so yeah, he he was a little he was uh, doing great things in his 20s, and so I guess we all aspire to be like that. <laughs> so let me ask you this, right? So there's a lot of you know th there has been, let's say, some controversy surrounding pluto right recently <laughs> because it was just declassified as a planet right so what what what's going on there madeline why why is that why is that a thing why did we do that so after pluto was discovered they kept discovering these you know icy bodies mm -hmm. within its vicinity and you know they were also discovering these very similar sized objects mm -hmm. And so the International Astro Astronomical Union, they were just like, we need to like figure something out because either like, they just like, they wanted to clarify the definition of what it means to be a planet. Mm -hmm. And so at that meeting, which I think actually was this century too, they defined a planet, at least in our solar system, it orbits the sun, it has enough mass to, um, kind of have a spherical, sphere-like shape. Mm -hmm. And and this is the important one, is that it has to be able to clear its own orbit. Hmm. And for that specific reason, that last one, yeah. Pluto didn't fail to meet that criteria, which is why it ended up getting demoted. Mm. Got you. But it's not totally like it's just a dwarf planet now right like yeah. just a tiny planet right. yeah so okay. basically okay. if you and there are several objects like this like i think for example iris yep falls into this category where they they orbit the sun and they uh have the, enough mass to make that spherical like shape mm -hmm. but they just they're not they don't have quite enough mass to be able to clear their orbits. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, you may be sad that Pluto got demoted, but that doesn't mean that Pluto is not cool. In I mean, fact, fair. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, NASA still thought it was cool. Although I think the demotion might have happened after this, ha this happened, but NASA actually in... January 2006 launched a probe called New Horizons mm -hmm. to go on a flyby pl by Pluto. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Now, have we gotten there already? Have we seen stuff? Like, what's... Yeah. Yeah. We actually have. Nice. So in July of 2015 mm -hmm. was the closest flyby that New Horizons actually got of Pluto. When was that again? July 2015. Mm, got you. Now, is New Horizons like in orbit around Pluto or what's going on with it next? Do you know? Unfortunately, it's not in orbit around Pluto. Mm. 
it's currently, you know, hitchhiking across the Kuiper Belt. Yeah. Um, it's doing like some flybys of it's done flybys of other Kuiper Belt objects, mm -hmm. and it's also just kind of like doing science in general out there. Doing cool science stuff. Yeah. And I'm sure that perhaps in in the future it might uh follow in the footsteps of Voyager One and Voyager Two and yep. Pioneer Nine and Ten and leave the solar system. Gotcha. Yes. On to bigger and better things. Cool. Oh yes. Yep. Still love Pluto though. <laughs> yeah. You can always love Pluto even though it's a dwarf planet. Pluto's still cool. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. All right guys. So uh, today in astronomy wasn't the only thing that we were doing today, right? We also had talked about doing, um, you know, or exploring different constellations in our night sky that we can see, right? So I tasked everybody in, in Constellation Crew, so I tasked Madeline and, and Nicolette to uh, pick a constellation that they liked and kind of talk about it and, and take us through what's really cool about it, some of the highlights, and then um, kind of do a, you know, superficial sort of deep dive right into into something um, about that constellation, right? So we're going to go ahead and start out with Nicolette. So Nicolette, while, while you're talking about your constellation, I'm going to find it on the, you know, I'll find it in Stellarium, which is a free program. Highly recommend anybody to use it. You can go anywhere in time and space. We have taken advantage of that already. Um, if you haven't checked out our episode last week, when we, um, actually traveled back, you know, a few thousand years to, um, Ireland and, and talked about Celtic astronomy, please do. Um, but tonight we're going to be using it and finding some of these objects and, um, you know, talking about these constellations. So Nicolette, what, what do you got, what do you got coming up for us? What, what constellation are we looking at and where can I find it? Okay. So today we're going to be talking about one of my sort of secret, not secret obsession. Um, I love <laughs> twinning and twins of things, pairs twinning. of things. Twinning. Yes. Is that I like winning, with but with mom. twins? Hmm? Is that like winning, but with twins? I guess you could say that because okay. I love to twin with my mom. And honestly, our fashion sense is a total win. And when yep. we go out together and we're matching, it's great. Um, That's fair. <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you and I should twin sometime, Nicola. Yes. That would I don't know if our fashion senses would mesh, but we should try it sometime. You got you to gotta borrow one of her berets. I do have yes. an expensive hat collection so that I have plenty of berets for you. <laughs> there you go. See? But on the subject of twins, we are going to be looking at Gemini, the twins. So the, it's kind of hard to find in the night sky, in my opinion, because it's not like a square mm -hmm. or a triangle, easy to see. But we can use our good old friend, Orion, and use one of its bright stars, Betelgeuse, which is Orion's shoulder, if you will. I don't know, We're it's his make... armpit in this picture. It's his armpit. Oh, yeah, it is yeah. his armpit. <laughs> We're going to make a sort of diagonal line um, going that way. Correct. Um, I was trying to figure out the direction. I'm like, going I don't know. Going that what... way. Yeah, that way. Specific, <laughs> I like it. And we go straight up until you start seeing a pretty bright star or two. Keep going up further. Mm. There you go. Oh. And that star right there, the bigger one, mm -hmm. is Pollux. And right next to it is the star Castor, mm -hmm. Castor and Pollux. And those are the twin stars of Gemini. <laughs> so we're looking in the south, almost the southeast, right? It's about <laughs> nine o'clock here in in, um, in Stellarium, right? So at about nine o'clock tonight in Muncie, we're looking right, you know, south, southeast. And we're just going straight up, like Nicolette said. We can use Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or however you want to say it, right? Um, you can kind of make a line if you think about it, right? You can make a line with maybe Orion's foot and then his mm -hmm. belt and then his um, armpit or shoulder, right? <laughs> and we can make that line all the way up and, and we can find those two stars like Nicoletta just said, right? So Castor and Pollux. Yes. And oh boy. I'm so excited. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to stick to these two stars for a second okay. because Pollux is the brightest in the constellation, the brightest star, and Castor is the second brightest. Look at that. The two twin stars right next to each other. <laughs> um, almost like so, they planned it, right? It's almost like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're twinning. 
they're twinning. Oh my lord. Okay, I'm oh, done. I'm out. See only, you guys. I'm I'm gone. <laughs> it's only deeper than that because Castor and Pollux. We're not going to dive into the Greek myth. And if you want to, there are some episodes in the past where I, I do talk about Gemini. Mm-hmm. Castor and Pollux are twins in Greek mythology. Um, <laughs> so. But yes, the funny thing about these stars is that they're both very unique. Um, Castor in particular, it looks like one point. It looks like a star, right, from our perspective. But actually, it's a binary star system. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? Yeah. So it's two stars Hmm. orbiting each other, which is super cool. We're talking about Um, Pollux, right? uh, Castor. Castor. Hold on. So you're saying Castor. I'm going to see if we can see that. Hold on. Oh, 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 look at that. Look at that. Heck yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. That's not even the one. Oh my gosh. Hold on. I'm going to pause this. It's going too fast. Okay. So we got the binary system. Yeah. Hmm. It's very, very cool. And it's orbital period. So kind of like how earth orbits around the sun, Mm -hmm. the stars are orbiting each other. So they also have an orbital period. Earth's orbital period is 365 days. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the binary star system's orbital period is less than a day. Wow. So Ah. Earth day, less than an Earth day. Less than an Earth day. They orbit each other in less than an Earth day, which I think is super cool. Hmm. So, and I didn't know. Yeah, because I I had no idea that Castor was a... uh dual or was a binary star system that's that's really yeah cool. i didn't know that either but aren't a lot of uh stars in our galaxy uh multi-star systems yes that is true is caster um, i'm assuming yeah never mind go ahead sorry um caster was said to be a visual binary so what i assume that means and i could be wrong but what i assume that means is that you can see that it's a binary with a telescope or binoculars there are other stars like that in our night sky, where if you looked at it closer with a telescope, it's actually two stars instead of one star. But um, for now, we'll just say that it is an eclipsing binary star system, which is super cool. Mm-hmm. Pollux, its twin, is the brightest star in its constellation, and it's kind of orange, but it is very large, twice as big as our sun. <laughs> uh, like or mass twice or... as massive. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Twice as massive as our Mm -hmm. sun. That's a lot better. And it is referred to as the second head of the twin. Sometimes. The second head of the twin? Are they like conjoined? I I don't know about that. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Like second head of the twin? I mean, in the picture, their arms, they're supposed to be like hugging. Like hugging each other? Yeah, but it it looks like like Caster's arm is just kind of... Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> interesting okay nope. if anyone wants to do some research and get back to the planetarium that would be great there you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but also inside this constellation is a really cool um deep sky object and i mm. love this creature on earth because it's named after a creature on earth it's called the jellyfish nebula did not know you liked jellyfish so much nicola they're so cute and then the cute squishy from nemo my little squishy um <laughs> yeah this looks like a brain to me man like that just right? straight looks like a brain to me yeah i can see that because you know your brain has that stem part so there's a part that's yeah at the bottom yeah but yeah and crew if you could help me out here with this because dur- during my research it said that they theorized this is more of the aftermath of a supernova so then is it still a nebula or is it an aftermath explosion kind of a thing like a planetary right? so um super and we'll get into this a little bit later on when we talk about um taurus which is which is the constellation i'll be talking about right but we'll kind of get into this a little bit but um it is both so it is a supernova remnant right but the um you know the surrounding so the bright part right the this part around it right that's the gas so that's actually what's expelled during that supernova explosion so the supernova remnant is actually the star that's left behind after a supernova right and then the nebula itself is is referring really to the gas cloud surrounding it all right thank you that was much better of a clarification (laughs) Mm -hmm. but 
that I think it's really, really cool. And they theorize, I couldn't see if it was a definite yes, there is, or a no, mm -hmm. there is not. They feel that there is either a neutron star or a pulsar, which mm -hmm. are very special and complicated stars yep. that do appear in our universe. But they, again, there isn't a definite yes or no, mm -hmm. but they theorize there's one there because it was quite a big supernova that they theorize happened mm -hmm. a long time ago. Cool wow. aftermath explosion. What a cool, mm -hmm. <laughs> what a cool nebula. So, oh, there's another one down here that's kind of cool. Okay, we'll get into nebulas later. We will get into nebulas yes. later. All right. <laughs> so, Nicolette, there's yes. one other thing that we got to talk about, right? Because Gemini has one not really in the constellation thing going on, right? But it's got that mm -hmm. twinning aspect. You're welcome for using that term, guys. Uh, it's got that <laughs> twinning aspect. Right. So what are we what are we talking about here? So sometimes um, names in astronomy are so amazing and so cool that when people are making new things here on Earth, they want to name it something really cool. So they pick an astronomy name. And in this case, there is an observatory mm -hmm. called Gemini Observatory. And it sounds singular, but it's not. So <laughs> there's a big complication with observatories where wherever it is, that's where it stays. It mm -hmm. doesn't move. It doesn't go anywhere. And so it's limited to that patch of the sky. Mm -hmm. And of course, the stars move as we move, or the stars move, and everything's moving. It's very chaotic. Right. But you're kind of just stuck there. And like Greg was doing earlier, you can't see through the ground. In Stellarium, you might be able to see through yes. the ground, but not on Earth. <laughs> right. So Gemini Observatory has two exact same slightly exact same observatories in slightly two different locations. Um, I really love this observatory, so I know a lot about it. One of them is in the northern hemisphere mm -hmm. in Hawaii on top of a dormant volcano. And the other is in the southern hemisphere on top of a mountain in Chile. So of course, the one in the northern hemisphere is called Gemini North. Mm -hmm. And the one in the southern hemisphere is called Gemini South. You think and they would have named one Castor and Pollux? Like they missed a real <laughs> opportunity there. They they really did. You know what I mean? Like just a real yeah. real missed opportunity. Can we like petition them to rename the telescopes? Yes, I'd sign. <laughs> well, it. The telescopes themselves also have names apparently, but I'm just gonna call them Gemini North and South Telescope because okay. the enough. point is, is that they're supposed to be twin 8.1 meter telescopes mm. in both observatories. So it's supposed to be the twinning thing going on they're supposed to be exactly yeah. the same now some instruments are shared by both telescopes meaning they both have the same kind of software mm -hmm. and instrumentation to do certain things um, this is an optical tel uh, telescope and observatory so they do things in visible light and stuff in the infrared light mm -hmm. um, but sometimes certain instrumentation is attached to one telescope and not the other so sometimes Gemini North has other stuff on their telescope that they can do, and Gemini South can't do that. Mm -hmm. But the basics, in order to do a lot of the basic stuff without getting into specifics, mm -hmm. is done by both telescopes. So that way you don't have to go to a different observatory. You can stick with Gemini and then just pick which one you need for your object. If yours is in the Southern Hemisphere, you can still stay with Gemini, which I think is super, super cool. Yeah. No, for sure. Absolutely. So, Gemini, we've we've talked about, right? That's pretty cool, right? Super interesting. I think the observatory thing, man, like, I just can't get over not naming it Castor and Pollux. Like, I just, like, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's just such a missed opportunity. So, when That's we look true. back at the night sky, right, we had Gemini, and again, we're, we're looking toward the south, right? Well, my constellation that I wanted to talk about is Taurus, right? Taurus the bull. So to find Taurus, we start with Orion's belt. And we typically start with Orion for a lot of these just because it's really easy to find, right? Because of Orion's belt. So you look at Orion's belt and you can imagine this imaginary line drawn from the south a little bit toward the southwest, right? And we can find... Taurus's eye, right? Now, when we 
really look at it, okay, if I turn off the constellation art and I turn on the atmosphere, it becomes a little easier to see, right? Because when we look at Taurus or when we look at Orion's belt and we move up, right, what we really find is we really find this V shape. That V shape is, is what we use then to, to talk about Taurus, right? And when we talk about Taurus, that bright star, right? The really bright star that's called Aldebaran. And Aldebaran is a, a huge, huge, massive red giant star. Um, and it's, wow. you know, kind of thought to be very similar to what might happen to our sun in the future because mm. Aldebaran is a red giant, right? And, um, it's about the same mass, so it's approximately one solar mass, but it's 44 times as large, right? So the radius is about 44 times as big as the sun's. Um, and eventually, big. right, our sun, when as it goes through its life cycle, and this is millions of years down the road, right, but our sun is going to expand into um, that red giant phase. And so it's kind of interesting that Aldebaran is, you know, already a red giant it's about one solar mass right so um it's kind of you know it's kind of interesting to think about right well and also in the constellation taurus there's this group of stars right in his body right and this is legitimately my favorite thing in in all of astronomy and in the entire night sky my favorite thing is this grouping of stars right here and what's this grouping of stars called, Crew? The Pleiades. That's the Pleiades, right? <laughs> I said Subaru. <laughs> you said Subaru? Okay. Yes. I mean, you're not, I'm not wrong. wrong, am I? <laughs> right, exactly. So Subaru does, yes, the Subaru logo is based on the five brightest stars of, um, um, of the Pleiades, right? Well, the Pleiades is a really interesting star cluster for a number of different reasons. So first off, Pleiades, the Pleiades is considered an asterism. And we've talked about asterisms a lot, but just to kind of remind everybody crew, what are we talking about when we say asterisms here? They're like a constellation, but not official. Exactly, yeah. right. And in this case, obviously the Pleiades are just much smaller, right? They're, they'd be, you know, much smaller than a constellation. But in the Pleiades, there's, there's you know, you can see, especially as you zoom in, right, there's a ton of stars in this in this star cluster. But when we look at it, there's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe a seventh in there, right, of the really bright stars in, in the Pleiades. And one of the interesting things is that um, throughout human history, the Pleiades has been seen in different ways, right? So the Greek mythology says, you know, that Zeus saved these, um, the Pleiades, which are the seven sisters, right? In, in Greek mythology, he saved them from Orion who chases them across the sky, right? And I thought it was really funny because you can kind of see that, right? With Orion, he's, he's always chasing the Pleiades, right? And, uh, Zeus saved the, um, sisters the seven sisters by putting them up in the sky right and it's been used by different civilizations over time to determine things like eyesight right so if you could see however many stars you could see right if you could see five six seven it would say you know you have really good eyesight you might be a good hunter you might be a good scout or or something like that right and it's um, just kind of interesting how and we talked about this last episode right and just how different cultures over time um can look at the same things and and come up with a lot of different stories and a lot of different um just things right different uses right because who would really think that you could use stars as an eye test right um but that was really so, cool so i thought that was really interesting it's ancient optometry it is <laughs> exactly no and that's exactly you're right i mean and that's that's true um but it's just kind of interesting right so that's not the only stuff that's in Taurus and Nicolette kind of alluded to this earlier, but the other thing that's in Taurus that we can talk about, right, is the crab nebula. So when we were talking about the, the crab or when we were talking about the jellyfish nebula, right, we were talking about the um, different and let me pause this. Otherwise, it's going to go across my screen. But anywho, so when we were talking about the um, jellyfish nebula right we were talking about how there's this bright gas surrounding whatever the supernova remnant would be 
right? And in the Crab Nebula's case, that supernova remnant is a white dwarf star. So when we talk about supernovas, what are, what are, what are we talking about here? So Madeline or Nicolette, what are we talking about when we say supernova? To put it... Star goes boom. Yeah, there you go. exactly. I like it. To put it more epically. <laughs> I like boom. it. Yeah, so supernovas are some of the most violent events in our entire universe, right? And if a star is massive enough, when it, you know, when it starts to, um, when in the gravity, when the force of gravity finally starts to overcome the force of the nuclear fusion that would be pushing out, right? It can ignite a supernova explosion, right? And that's thought to be where a lot of the heaviest elements in our periodic table come from as well, right? Or in supernova mm -hmm. explosions. And so sometimes, depending on the type of supernova, they can leave behind. So they can leave something behind, right? And the Crab Nebula left behind a white dwarf star. And as far as we know, white dwarves are not normal for, are dwarf. not common, yeah, are not common um, remnants for supernovas. Usually those are, um, you know, neutron stars or black holes, right? And so it is kind of interesting that the Crab Nebula has a white dwarf at the center of it um, is because, again, that's a, that's a little uncommon. Um, it's not the only one, but it, but it is a little uncommon to see that. Right? You, know, you know what were two things I just realized? Hmm? A, we have an abundance of uh, sea life represented in our deep sky objects tonight. True. And also, I had always thought that the Crab Nebula was in Cancer the Crab, but I guess I was wrong. Yeah, so it is kind of funny, right? Um, and if you look at the, you know, what we were just looking at, right, with the constellation labels, it's not even close to Cancer, right? So yeah, the Crab Nebula, let me search that again just to show where it's at. But um, it, it, you know, it's funny is it could be considered to be in a couple different constellations really i mean it is obviously right by um taurus's uh horn here right yeah. but it's close to orion right um it's close to to gemini right um it's close to Auriga, okay perseus is close whatever but cancer is like all the way you know pretty far away from it so it's just kind of funny that um the crab nebula isn't in cancer right um and the other kind of interesting thing about the Crab Nebula, um, and this is something that just I didn't even know until um, really I got into my research here, but but the Crab Nebula is used in some um, areas of research as a unit. So uh, when we talk about um, when when specifically in, in high energy astrophysics stuff, right, when you talk about the energy of different objects, they're you they use crab units so crab units are, are seen in some um in actually quite a few research journals and research papers which i think is kind of interesting wow. um i did not know it had its own units mm -hmm. and it was because it was the first actually object that we observed that um had some of the high energy gamma rays coming from um and so we just oh. call it and it's and it's also very steady i mean it's very steady um which is why we use the the crab units as, as a unit I'll have to, uh, my family has inside jokes about crabs with regard to my brother, so I'll have to tell them about this. Nice. Yeah. All right, Madeline. So we talked about Gemini. We talked about Taurus. We got a really exciting one coming up too, right? What, what are we talking about now and how do I find it? So now we are going to be talking about Cassiopeia. Nice. So... If we go to the northwestern sky. Northwestern. All right. Just so we don't give everybody vertigo, I'm going to go a little slow here. <laughs> so, honestly, the easiest way to find Cassiopeia is it looks like a W. Mm. Although, to be quite honest, I, <laughs> I don't know. You know those kind of like microscopes you would play with in like biology class mm -hmm. in like high school? I always thought it looked kind of like one of those, but the W works just as well, mm -hmm. especially for people who aren't in the life sciences. Yeah, so for sure. Kind of a sideways in, W, but I feel you. Yeah, yeah. so which is, which is probably why I thought it looked like a microscope. Mm. But uh, 
Anyways, it's kind of sandwiched between Andromeda and Pegasus to the west, mm -hmm. and then Cepheus and Ursa Minor. Mm -hmm. Um, if for some reason you can't find the W right away, go find Polaris and Ursa Minor, mm -hmm. and then draw a line north or northwest mm -hmm. towards Cassiopeia. But personally, I've always found it easy to just find the W. Yeah. Can confirm so, the W does exist in the sky, even with some light pollution. Can confirm. <laughs> yeah, which is why it I is like Nicolette confirmed. That means it's a one hundred percent <laughs> fact. Just don't even yeah. don't even question it. Never Google it. Just fact. Yeah. So there you go with finding mm -hmm. Cassiopeia. Um, and there's actually a lot of stuff, a lot of fun stuff in Cassiopeia, mm -hmm. kind of following the little theme. There are some supernova remnants, which these are the most famous mm -hmm. uh, deep sky objects in Cassiopeia. Mm -hmm. So first we can go to Cass A. Mm -hmm. Cass just is short for Cassiopeia because sometimes you're just like i don't want to write out that many letters mm. no hey I'm, I'm with you i get you you've seen my first and last name i can firmly agree <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> nicola has a very long last name but in any case um cassiope or cassiopeia a is a very like it's a little bit hard to see in this image but it's a very like circular looking mm -hmm. supernova remnant and so that is very like aesthetically pleasing mm -hmm. and fortunately the other supernova remnant in this constellation Tycho mm -hmm. named after um Tycho Brahe I forget how I pronounce his last name but I've always heard Brahe um, but oh, yeah okay so he ha also has a supernova remnant named after him and it looks very similar to Cass A. Mm -hmm. Both of these um, were likely observed in like the, I think for um, Tycho, it's was like observed in like the 1570s mm -hmm. first. And then the uh, Cass A was observed in like the 1600s, but mm -hmm. they didn't really recognize what it was until about the 1940s. Gotcha. So those two things are probably the most famous mm -hmm. deep sky objects, but this is Madeline we're talking about. And I would be remiss not to show off some galaxies. Specifically, and... what kind of galaxies, Madeline? Yeah. So, yeah, they are dwarf galaxies, which mm. is what I have done research in. And I would there never are have guessed that they'd galaxies. be dwarves. What? <laughs> so I never would have guessed they would have been dwarves. Dwarf planets tonight, dwarf galaxies. What are we gonna are we gonna tell the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves now too? <laughs> I should. Seven I should. dwarf galaxies. We should we should hey the Pleiades, right? Seven dwarves. Perfect. Done. I'm out. Like done. Yeah, I see, and I was I had to prepare Pluto and Cassiopeia, so I can't believe I didn't put the connection together, but here we are. Um That's funny. Anyways, the two galaxies in question. They are NGC uh, 147 and then NGC 185. All and right. they're really, really close to each other. So let's start with 147. Aww. So as you can see, it's a baby little so dwarf galaxy. Mm -hmm. it's not a whole lot, but you know, dwarf galaxies are galaxies too, as I always like to say. Just like dwarf planets are planets too, right? <laughs> I have a feeling some astronomers would um would disagree. Fair enough. Yeah, Fair they enough. they would strongly disagree considering all the controversy around the Pluto gang demoted. Fair point. But the fun fact about NGC 147 and 185, they're close to each other in the sky, mm -hmm. but they're also I think it might be that bright spot right there. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I was, hey, yeah, so. I figured that was true, but I just wanted to make sure, you know. All yeah, right. We were, 
In any case, the really fun fact is these two galaxies are actually satellites of the Andromeda galaxy, mm. which is kind of funny because Androm they're obviously not in the constellation of Andromeda, but they're really, really close to the boundary between the constellations. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can see just how, yeah, see, there you go. Yeah. Andromeda is not so far away. So we got 147, right? And then we had 185, right? And Andromeda is all the way over here. Yep. Yeah. Andromeda is a big galaxy too. So that's got some strong gravity. So even though those may seem kind of far apart, right? And first off, in astronomical sense, they're not. And then also second yeah. off, it's got some strong, strong gravity, right? Because we also have some of those dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way, right? Yeah, we definitely, we have a lot of uh, dwarf galaxies that are satellites of our own. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I don't know, Andromeda, I mean, big galaxies in general, they have a, hob a habit of like acquiring and taking in these, you know, mm -hmm. lost little galaxies. Right. <laughs> that need them. But they're not lost. They're following Andromeda. Follow the leader. There you go. You know? Yeah. yeah, it's it's an extra galactic follow the leader. Just think of <laughs> just think of Andromeda as Snow White, and <laughs> think of. <laughs> I'm done. Okay. All right. Sorry. I had to. I had to. You you know. I, had I mean, to. I I left myself open for that joke. So yeah. it's just T-ball, right? Just I, had, like, I just had it. Exactly. Oh, I used to play that as a kid. I get the I get the joke. <laughs> that's good i'm glad Nicolette. Heck yeah Heck yeah <laughs> anyways so you might be like oh like you know these are dwarf galaxies i can't possibly see them in my telescope but ngc one if you're gonna do this uh go to as dark an area as you can mm -hmm. but you can actually see ngc 185 mm -hmm. in a telescope it's just it's gonna be really difficult so if you want to challenge yourself, go observe it. And if you were wondering where on earth would I know where to find or how to find a dark sky patch, highly recommend last Constellation Crew episode, Madeline provided some amazing resources yeah. for finding any object in the sky, identifying them, finding places um, around you to that are good observing spaces stuff like that so highly recommend you checking out yeah. our uh, previous episode too where yeah. madeline talks about all of that shout out to uh dr barrington for um telling us about some of those resources mm -hmm. last semester so yeah i'll give a little shout out there yep. remember madeline last semester as well when we were looking at galaxies in some of the telescopes here at ball state Oh, and yeah. how you and I both agreed that looking at galaxies sometimes with telescopes can look like someone sprinkled some salt on the lens, you know, it's a little bit more dusty looking. That's kind of yeah. what galaxies may or may not, you never know, use your own analogy, mm -hmm. look like in a telescope when you're looking around. So if you see something that looks like it, you got a little dusty, a little salty, <laughs> a little salty. <laughs> so it might be a galaxy. You got some salt on your, uh, yeah, you got some, you got, some, there you go. Just that, that salt action. I like it. Yep. <laughs> doing the, doing the chef's kiss salt way. I love it. <laughs> I love that. All Let's right, say. crew. Anything else for tonight? No. Stay salty, my friends. <laughs> Stay salty. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, there will be no Constellation crew next week, but be sure to tune in the week after. So in two weeks, um, we'll be back with some Constellation crew content. Okay. Um, as always, you can follow the Brown Planetarium um, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. The social media handles are up on the screen now. Um, that's it for us. Have a great weekend, everyone. And, and we'll see you in just a couple short weeks. Okay. Peace out, y'all.